Today we're going to talk about uh, dominant optic atrophy, uh, which is a uh, uh, focus uh, of uh, what we're doing uh, in the lab. And um, I think that, uh, uh, as I said, uh, Vanya gave um, us an, a basic introduction about uh, the focus of uh, my talk, which is an uh, uh, upper one. But I'd like to remind you what is autosomal dominant optic atrophy which is a blinding disease that affects <clears throat> specifically uh, retinal ganglion cells that connect the neural retina to the LG and the thalamus. Uh, however, this is a multi-systemic uh, disease, but the presentation, the clinical presentation of the patients is mostly because of uh, visual. Uh, so there is a, a big question here, and that is um, why uh, Notwithstanding the fact that uh, OPA1 is uh, ubiquitously expressed and it's not more abundant uh, in retinal ganglion cells than in other retinal cells, uh, we have uh, a problem uh, that specifically affects uh, the cells at least leading them to, uh, to the clinical presentation. Um, we thought in the beginning that one of the, possi uh, one of the possibilities, uh, sorry, but I can't actually move my slides here. Okay, one of the possibilities is that um, it, the unique anatomy of uh, these uh, cells uh, might be the culprit. Indeed, uh, the retina ganglion cells are both unmyelinated and myelinated, and the myelinated region is, of course, the optic nerve region, and mitochondria need uh, to distribute uh, uh, properly in uh, between the unmyelinated region uh, so that they can actually sustain uh, the function of, uh, of the cells and they can, uh, and they can actually uh, allow the retina ganglion cells to, to work. So uh, we decided to therefore to extend our basic studies uh, that were cited by Vanya in uh, and were performed in cellular models that were different from uh, retinal ganglion cells into a, a true retinal ganglion cell. Uh, this was uh, quite challenging because we do not have uh, cells uh, uh, that can be propagated in culture uh, that uh, are faithfully reproducing retinal ganglion cells. Uh, so we had to devise a system uh, to establish primary retinal ganglion cells mouse because we also wanted to use uh, uh, mouse models of uh, gene deletion. Um, this, uh, as I said, was uh, quite challenging. Nevertheless, we succeeded and uh, therefore we could uh, proceed by expressing a few mutants of OPPO1 uh, that were previously characterized in uh, our lab and in other labs. And two of these mutants are uh, here highlighted, A301A in the GTPA's domain, R905 stop in the C-terminal called the call domain of the protein, plus another mutant uh, which we always express as a control. Uh, this is actually a, a relevant mutant or even an activating mutant that was described uh, in uh, this paper by Yamaguchi. And, uh, uh, so this is a picture that you're going to see uh, in uh, in uh, quite a lot in the, the course of this presentation. Uh, here you have a, a cert volume rendered the reconstruction of confocal images of mitochondria that are being labeled with a fluorescent, uh, red fluorescent protein that is, is targeted to the mitochondrial matrix uh, in uh, uh, beta tubulin stain primary mouse. You can uh, appreciate the soma and the new rights that we have in culture. Uh, and uh, you can also appreciate that uh, in these cells, the mitochondria distribute evenly in the soma and, uh, of course, enter into the rights. If you overexpress wild type uh, OPA1, you see that the mitochondria elongate as it was expected given the profusion function of. Uh, However, if you express uh, pathogenic mutants of uh, OPA1, like the K301A uh, and the, and the R905 stop, uh, what you observe is that uh, mitochondria now are congregated 
avoid the axon of HILO, that is this portion of uh, the retinal ganglion cells. And you don't really see many mitochondria in uh, the axon, something very similar to what uh, has been previously shown by uh, Banya. Uh, this is a, a quantification of many, many experiments that have been performed with this primary retinal ganglion cells. And you see that whenever we have uh, the pathogenic uh, ADOA mutants, you have shorter mitochondria, and that these shorter mitochondria are excluded uh, from the uh, axon. So, uh, for the sake of time, I'm not going to uh, show you that indeed, as it was expected, these mitochondria harboring pathogenic OPA1 mutants uh, are heterogeneously dysfunctional uh, and that they are uh, therefore targeted for uh, mitophagy if you express parkin which is uh, normally not expressed in uh, uh, Indeed, uh, all this uh, phenotype of the fragmented uh, mitochondria that are depolarized and that are also stationary, similar to what also Vanya has uh, shown, uh, indicate perhaps that these mitochondria are being targeted for autophagic. Uh, so we decided to verify uh, this possibility uh, by doing a, a rather simple experiment that was to label simultaneously mitochondria uh, and autophagosomes, mitochondria in red, uh, by using a red fluorescent protein targeted to the mitochondria and autophagosomes in green by using a yellow fluorescent protein uh, tagged version of the autophagosomal marker. And this is uh, how uh, the soma of uh, normal uh, retinal uh, ganglion cell looks like. You see uh, that the mitochondria are widely distributed and evenly distributed in, uh, in the soma. The asterisk points uh, to the axonal hillock. Uh, and if you express OPA1, you don't see many. Autophagosomes are also evenly distributed in the soma. However, if you look at uh, uh, pathogenic OPA1 mutants, you see that as we observed previously, uh, mitochondria harboring ADOA and OPA1 mutants, they tend to congregate towards the axon of HILOC, where we also find uh, a lot of uh, the output. This was rather indicative uh, uh, because uh, uh, suggested that perhaps uh, what was happening in the ADOA retinal ganglion cells was that the activation of autophagy in a partially constrained uh, location that was the axon of HILOC was perhaps responsible for the striking phenotype of observing less mitochondria into the, into the axon. So we tested uh, whether this was a possibility uh, by turning to uh, a genetic model of autophagy inhibition that is given by a monolelic deletion of uh, the essential autophagy gene, APG7. This gene is involved in autophagosomal maturation. That is the process that leads to the formation of uh, this autophagic uh, vesicles. Uh, I should stress that we uh, turned to monolelic deletion of APG7 because it is known that in retinal ganglion cells, uh, full-blown inhibition of uh, autophagy for long times, like the one that you observe in uh, uh, mouse knockouts for essential autophagy genes, is detrimental. So uh, you should believe uh, me that, uh, I don't have time to show you that if you take uh, one allele of ATG7 out from this retinal ganglion cells, uh, autophagic flux, that is the measurement of how efficient the autophagy is, is uh, in uh, so what happens to uh, mitochondrial uh, distribution when we have uh, an issue uh, in, uh, when we inhibit uh, autophagy? Uh, the, as you can see again here, this is uh, APG7 monolelic uh, flux cells. Uh, you express the ADOA mutant OPA KT1A, and you see very few mitochondria in the axon a lot of autophagosomes and of mitochondria in the axon. When we actually ablate one allele by expressing also three, 
Now you see that you restore the distribution of mitochondria, you restore the entry of mitochondria into the axon. And uh, if you measure all the parameters of, of localization between uh, mitochondria and autophagosomes, and most importantly of axonal uh, mitochondria, uh, this is not millimeter, it's micrometer. Sorry for the mistake. You can clearly see that when you delete uh, autophagy, the hatched bars uh, over here, now you completely restore the localization of mitochondria. This is good for the retina ganglion cells because when uh, uh, you express pathogenic copper one mutants in these uh, retina ganglion cells, uh, they're not happy. And, uh, you know, they, they tend to die after our days of culture, but if you simultaneously delete uh, one autophagy, one allele of the essential autophagy gene, the G7, now they survive really nicely. Okay, so uh, at this point, we know that uh, pathogenic COP1 mutants uh, cause the accumulation of phagosomes at the axon of HELOC in proximity to fragmented mitochondria, and if we uh, genetically inhibit autophagy, uh, mitochondria can redistribute into the axon and uh, we preserve uh, There is, of course, a, a question that is uh, mechanistic, if you wish, and that is how do we explain uh, that the autophagosomes are congregating at the axon? Uh, so to try to understand uh, this uh, problem, uh, we turn back to what was known about the mechanisms uh, that control uh, uh, autophagy in retina ganglion cells, uh, especially in response to uh, mitochondrial issues, uh, such as the polarization and dysfunction that we observe uh, in our, uh, in our uh, cells expressing pathogenic of one. And uh, as you can appreciate from the scheme, upon mitochondrial depolarization, you have activation of K. Uh, which then uh, leads to uh, YULC-1-2 activation, which uh, causes um, uh, autophagosomal, autophagosomal production. So we tested whether indeed we were observing in our cells uh, accumulation of active NPK in the uh, axon of HELOC upon expression of pathogenic uh, OPO1. Um, we therefore uh, tested the uh, uh, whether an antibody that stains for uh, active phospho-MPK could reveal a segregation of activated AMPK in retinal ganglion cells uh, expressing pathogenic OPA1. Uh, so in uh, cells that uh, express, uh, that do not express uh, OPA1 mutants, you see that uh, this phospho-MPK uh, is uh, generally well distributed in soma. Uh, if you uh, then, however, uh, stain for uh, the same antibody in cell in retina ganglion cells that express uh, mutated uh, OPA1, you see that there is an increase in the staining, especially in the uh, axonal HELOC. Uh, and if you repeat the experiment over and over, and you uh, and you basically draw a vector that goes from the HELOC to the posterior part of the soma, and you quantify the intensity of this staining in the, along the vector, which is plotted over here. You can see uh, that when you express pathogenic OPA1 mutants, you have more NPK, active NPK in the axonal HELOC region as compared to the uh, even distribution of phospho NPK uh, when you express uh, Wild type OPA1 or this uh, irrelevant mutant that I mentioned in the very beginning. So, this was interesting uh, because it pointed to the possibility that uh, what we were observing was uh, a consequence of uh, uh, localized NPK activation. So, we decided to uh, verify whether by inhibiting um, uh, NPK in a genetic manner by using a dominant uh, negative NPK construct. Uh, we were able to uh, restore the distribution uh, of autophagosomes, of mitochondria, and the entry of mitochondria. So this is a um, control uh, retinal ganglion cell that, again, uh, has the 
uh, Vanna labeled in red, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, algosomes are labeled uh, green, in which, uh, uh, sorry, this is in which we expressed uh, the MPK dominant negative. And I, I think that you can appreciate that uh, my fauna are not polarized together with the autophagosomes in the uh, axon of hillock region, but they're evenly distributed in the soma. And more importantly, you get mitochondria entering. This mitochondria is still uh, uh, fragmented, hmm? uh, as you can appreciate uh, from their functive form uh, appearance. Yet, they are now retrieved. Uh, so indeed, dominant negative NPK uh, corrects the somatic distribution of the corner, so they're no longer skewed towards the axon of uh, corrects the autophagosomal uh, uh, distribution in uh, soma. Their autophagosomes are now evenly distributed. They're no longer uh, skewed towards the axon of hillock. And most importantly, restores the number of uh, autophagos of mitochondria that are inside the, uh, that are inside the, the axon as uh, uh, testified by this uh, heated mechanism, which you see that when we have dominant, uh, dominant uh, negative NPK together with our pathogenic OPA1 mutants, uh, we now go back for normal the corneal density. So, we, uh, I think that we can conclude that uh, there is active NPK in proximity of the axon of hillock, and that genetic inhibition of NPK leads to distribution of mitochondria and autophagosomes in uh, soma. But of course, uh, the, the this is very nice uh, cell biology, uh, but there is a big question here, whether this is of any relevance. So uh, to address this uh, question, we um, started a collaboration uh, with a group of Nectarios Tavernarakis uh, in, uh, in Crete. Uh, he's uh, an expert uh, on uh, my, uh, my, my, my on autophagy in uh, neurons of uh, C. elegans, which is a fantastic model uh, because you can uh, do genetics and you can simultaneously image uh, mitochondria. And uh, so the first uh, set of experiments that he performed uh, was, uh, of course, in a different uh, type of neurons. We don't have retinal ganglion cells, uh, these uh, animals. Uh, so these are GABAergic uh, and he uh, used mitochondrial dysfunction by treating uh, uh, worms uh, paraquat. And what he observed was that upon paraquat uh, treatment, again, you see way less mitochondria into the uh, axons of uh, GABAergic neurons, and uh, uh, mitochondria uh, actually congregate together with the autophagosomes in uh, the uh, axonal. Uh, so then he performed a, a genetic experiment, like the one that we had been performing in uh, retinal ganglion cells. So he ablated uh, uh, autophagy in the worms uh, by ablating uh, LC3, uh, which is called LGG2 in uh, worms. And uh, what they observed was, again, you know, no mitochondria in the axons upon paraquat uh, intoxication. But if you inhibit autophagy, now, can redistribute. Yeah, so this is the quantification of the experiment that I just uh, He then went on to test the molecular pathway that we had described in the retinal ganglion cells. And he did again the same experiment of uh, causing mitochondrial dysfunction with paraquat and testing whether NPK dominant negative or deletion of NPK was capable of restoring the mitochondrial occupancy of the less mitochondria upon treatment in uh, the neurons of these uh, axons, but if you delete the uh, K, you now go back to a normal uh, distribution. This is the experiment that I just uh, mentioned. He then even created a, a model uh, in uh, uh, allergic neurons uh, of C. elegans of uh, uh, 
at Doha by expressing uh, our uh, OPA 1K301A mutant. Uh, and he reported again that you have uh, this fragmented short uh, mitochondria that are less uh, uh, frequently observed in axons of uh, GABAergic. Uh, he then, uh, uh, again, inhibited autophagy, and I think that you can appreciate that now the number of mitochondria that we observe in uh, uh, neurons is way higher. This is uh, the experiment that I just uh, mentioned. So this was very indicative for us because it basically uh, told us that uh, the pathway is conserved also in vivo, at least in C. elegans. Um, but we didn't know whether this was uh, relevant uh, in vivo for uh, retinal ganglion cell function and visual output. So we decided to generate a mouse model of uh, uh, conditional ablation of OPA1 in a subset of uh, retinal ganglion cells that are uh, sensitive uh, to uh, vision in the XY axis. This is driven by a specific grid, uh, which is called grid 4. Uh, and indeed, the expression of Greek 4, the crossing of Greek 4P with uh, the OPA1 flux flux mouse leads to uh, the uh, patchy appearance of OPA1 uh, depleted uh, retinal ganglion cells observed here. Any more detail in this uh, image? Here we stain for OPA1. You see that there are a number of retinal ganglion cells that do not express uh, OPA1 uh, as opposed to the widespread. Uh, expression of OPA1 in the wild type. Uh, very interestingly, if we co-stain for uh, uh, autophagosome and OPA1, when we have no OPA1 in retinal ganglion cells, we have a lot of uh, autophagy, and we also measure the autophagy in other ways. So then uh, we really uh, moved to important assays uh, of uh, visual uh, function in these mice. Uh, one of them uh, is the so-called optokinetic reflex assay, uh, which is a, a way of measuring mouse. Uh, how does this uh, assay work? Mice are placed in a dark chamber. They are presented with uh, uh, visual uh, stimuli, which consists of rotating drums in which stripes uh, are uh, alternating, uh, rotating uh, randomly towards the left, uh, or towards the uh, right. And there is a camera uh, that recognizes whether the mouse uh, had started the optokinetic reflex and moves uh, uh, the eyes and the head towards uh, the direction of the repeating drum. If uh, uh, the mouse uh, moves the head towards the repeating drum, this is scored by the computer as a positive uh, response, meaning that the mouse is capable of seeing uh, uh, so this is uh, how this analysis looks uh, in three months old and four months old uh, mouse uh, model, uh, OPA1 uh, retina ganglion cell knockout mice. And you can see that uh, there is a, some, some, some uh, uh, impairment which is not statistically significant already at three months, but at four months, this is full blown. And uh, uh, the uh, OPA1 knockout mice they are uh, really visually impaired all over the frequency and uh, the type of stimulus that they are present. Okay. Uh, so uh, this was in, uh, very important because it allowed us uh, to basically test the hypothesis in vivo that uh, by inhibiting uh, autophagy, we could uh, restore uh, mouse visual light. So uh, we crossed uh, uh, ATG7 mice with uh, OPPO1 uh, retinal ganglion cell knockout mice, again, deleting only one allele. And uh, uh, what we observed first was that if you actually delete uh, OPA1, you get out phagosome accumulation in the retinal ganglion cells, uh, which is fully ablated uh, by the deletion of uh, one allele of it. Um, most importantly, this uh, genetic uh, inhibition of autophagy was capable of uh, inhibiting completely uh, the uh, visual defect that we were observing in our uh, OPA1 knockout mice. Concentrate on the graph on the right hand side of uh, the slide, 
you can see these in yellow are the OPPO1 knockout mice. Uh, these uh, in uh, red and in green are the control mice. If in the knockout mice we have late autophagy, which is here in cyan, you see that the visual acuity is perfectly preserved. And this is true not only at four months, but up to 12 months, which is uh, until we analyze it. This is indeed the 12 months. So this is persistent uh, and it's very interesting. But we did a further test and this is, uh, these are my last uh, slides in which we looked at um, visual acuity in a, uh, in a, in a full uh, assay. So mice are, do not like to stay uh, in the water. Uh, so they try to swim uh, as much as they can towards an elevated platform that is here being um, signaled to the mouse by a screen with vertical stripes. So the mice know that wherever there is the screen with vertical stripes, there is the platform. This is alternative. This is the wild type mouse. And, and here you see what happens if you actually don't have OPPO1. The mouse really doesn't know where to go. It swims around and eventually it will uh, reach uh, the platform, but in a very random uh, fashion. If you delete also ATG7, mouse looks like a wild type. Finds immediately the platform because of the visual view that was presented to the mouse, and this is a view. So uh, I think that um, uh, we have uh, unveiled uh, a very important pathogenic mechanism uh, for autosomal dominant optic atrophy. Uh, that is that uh, these dysfunctional mitochondria are activating NPK locally in the axonal hillock, causing autophagosomal localization and uh, a sort of a traffic jam. Mitochondria are not able to enter into the uh, axon anymore. If they do so, if they don't enter into the axon, uh, retina ganglion cell dysfunction enters, and uh, this leads to the, uh, to the blindness, which we can correct uh, in vivo by uh, genetically inhibited. With this, I'd like to, uh, to thank uh, Marta Zaninello, who did uh, sing more basically almost single-handedly uh, handled all the study with the retina and ganglion cells. Uh, she got a lot of help by uh, Keiko Ivata for the vivo analysis, uh, Nectarios Tavernarakis, and Manos Palicares uh, did the C. elegant study and we collaborated with uh, Fred and uh, Fredo Sodun, and of course with Valerio Carelli uh, for many of the analysis that I didn't have time. Thank you so much for your attention.